Well, as you know, our topic this evening is uh, the grand strategy of the Bush administration. Um, if, you, if you announce that in the right way, you get lots of laughter and giggles, but this, we, we, we're not doing it that way, and uh, it is a, it's a wonderful topic. Uh, Professor Gaddis uh, teaches both the history of the Cold War at Yale and also courses on grand strategy, a uh, topic which he's taken seriously for a long time. A year ago in, in uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, the grand strategy of the Bush administration, the second term or the second uh, administration, uh, was, was its topic. So he certainly has pursued that topic, uh, general topic, uh, with profound interest over the years. And his work on the Cold War, which goes back decades, uh, is hugely uh, respected, uh, both uh, in the general public and especially among his colleagues in the, the academic world. Uh, certainly that body of work on the Cold War is, is the most re highly regarded, I think, of that by any of the current American scholars. Professor Gaddis enjoys a, a wonderful reputation. Um, he, was with our, he was with us in, in March of 1994. The topic then was uh, the post-Cold War world, which we're still in, in a way, although we're now in a post-9-11 world as, as well. Uh, I won't give as long an introduction as I did on that occasion. He's written more than 50 articles. They're published in the best of the journals. He's won numerous awards. His first book won three, including the Bancroft Prize. He's just recently received the National Humanities Medal uh, last year, uh, received numerous uh, commendations in between. He's published nine books, seven of which are on the Cold War. The most recent is uh, The Cold War, A New History, which will be available for signing after the program is over. It's not our topic of the evening, but it's a marvelous book and recently published. So uh, it's recommended to, to all of you. But as I said, our topic tonight is the grand strategy of the Bush administration. One of our central purposes as a council has been to try to look carefully at the logic and rationale of the current administration. Many of our programs are pointed in that direction. This one is absolutely central to what we try to do. Uh, we have one of the nation's foremost scholars. It's a great pleasure to present to you John Lewis Gaddis of Yale. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Frank, for that generous um, introduction. Thanks to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out. This is a huge audience in a beautiful setting. Uh, I get to look at the lights of the city off in the distance. You get to look at me. I think I have the better <laughs> deal in this. Uh, talking about the grand strategy of the Bush administration is challenging enough under normal circumstances. <laughs> talking about any grand strategy in the presence of my old friend Bob Bowie sitting over here is even more challenging <laughs> because I know he will challenge me in some way. So uh, Bob, it's very good to see you tonight. It's been a little over a year since President Bush took the oath of office for his second term and used that occasion to proclaim what has come to be known as the Bush Doctrine. And I quote from the second inaugural address, quote, it is the policy of the United States to seek and support the growth of democratic movements and institutions in every nation and culture with the ultimate goal of ending tyranny in our world." Unquote. Well, the year that has followed has not been a particularly good year for President Bush. As we all know, after a surprisingly sweeping electoral victory, his most important domestic initiative social security reform fizzled and flopped. Despite three successful elections in Iraq, the insurgency continues there and domestic support for the war has significantly eroded. Iran held a democratic election but produced a virulently anti-American government that seems bent on developing nuclear weapons and seems to be threatening to use them against Israel. The handling of the Hurricane Katrina disaster was a disaster at all levels of government, city, state, and federal, but Bush got much of the blame for it, uh, and it's fair that he should. The Harriet Myers nomination, the Scooter Libby indictment, suggested failures to think ahead on the part of a team that had previously prided itself on its ability to think ahead. 
And just last month, the president's principal ally in the Middle East, Ariel Sharon, fell victim to a devastating stroke, while the Palestinians, in their first, first truly democratic election, handed a surprise victory to yet another virulently anti-American and anti-Israeli party, Hamas. There was, I suppose, some consolation in the fact that the Canadians elected a somewhat more pro-American government. <laughs> But I rather doubt that the White House sees this as offsetting all the other things that have gone wrong in this difficult uh, fifth year of the Bush administration. All of which has got me as a historian to thinking back to fifth years of other two-term administrations with a view to making a few comparisons. I think, for example, of 1937 which turned out to be a very bad year for Franklin Roosevelt. He'd just come out of a landslide re-election victory, which gave him the bright idea of trying to pack the Supreme Court, which turned out to be a really bad idea. I think about 1949, which was a terrible year for Harry Truman, uh, what with the Soviet atomic bomb, the fall of China to communism, the increasingly plausible evidence since confirmed by the Soviet archives, that there really were spies operating within his administration. I think about 1957, a year I'm sure Bob will remember, not a very good year for Dwight Eisenhower, what with the Soviet launch of Sputnik, the development of the missile gap, and as I remember the forced resignation of a chief assistant, Sherman Adams, something about a Vicuna coat, as I recall. 1973 was a tr truly dreadful year for Richard Nixon, what with the eruption of the Watergate scandal. 1985 looked pretty good for Ronald Reagan, except that the events leading to the Iran-Contra scandal were already underway at that point. 1997 looked pretty good, too, for Bill Clinton, except that the events leading to the Monica Lewinsky scandal were already underway. My point is simply this, that with the exception of Nixon, None of these presidents is chiefly remembered today for the difficulties that beset them, even the self-inflicted difficulties that beset them, midway through their terms in office. And when it comes to grand strategy within the international arena, several of these presidents, FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, Nixon, and Reagan, though I think not Clinton, are seriously regarded now by historians as having been su highly successful practitioners of grand strategy. Um, even uh, Reagan is approaching the status of being considered a grand strategic genius in histories that are now being written of the Reagan administration. So it's probably a bit early, I think, to be writing off the Bush administration's strategy as a failure. This not, need not preclude an interim assessment, though, of its accomplishments and its shortcomings, and that's what I'd like to attempt this evening. Now, to do this, it's necessary, first of all, to specify what the Bush grand strategy set out to do. There is, I think, no single speech or document that lays all this out. Like most American grand strategies, Bush's was framed in response to unanticipated circumstances, specifically 9-11 and it has evolved and is still evolving over time. But I think the principal objectives have always been pretty clear. First and most fundamentally, to minimize the risk of further 9-11-like terrorist attacks on the United States or elsewhere in the world. Secondly, to remove or to alter regimes that might support such attacks. And third, and most ambitiously, to restructure the international system in such a way as to eliminate the conditions that breed terrorism in the first place. Now, this is to be sure to frame the strategy in terms of negatives. It focuses on what we're against. But I think there's nothing new in this. The same was true of the strategy of containment that the United States followed for four and a half decades during the Cold War. We were against the expanding influence of the Soviet Union and international communism. What the United States has been for both in the Cold War and in the post-Cold War world uh, is pretty simple, straightforward, and consistent over time. That is, we seek to ensure the survival, the security, and the prospering of our own institutions, chiefly democratic politics and market economics, which have now become the preferred institutions of most of the rest of the world. 
So how has the Bush administration done in each of these uh, three objectives uh, that I mentioned? Well, first of all, with regard to the first objective, minimizing the risk of future attacks quite well so far with a lot of fingers crossed at the same time. Everybody knows that uh, another attack could come within the next uh, few minutes. But the fact that we've gone through four and a half years without such an attack is, I think, a major success for the administration, not at all what one might have anticipated in the immediate aftermath of September 11. As you will remember very well, at that time, and particularly in the aftermath of the anthrax scare that followed 9-11, the general view was that we were in for a terrorist offensive, that more attacks on a severe scale, more severe scale, would surely follow, and that we would be lucky to get through the next few months without having one or more uh, take place. In fact, we have now got through some four and a half years. Now, perhaps this view that further attacks were to be forthcoming was excessively pessimistic. Perhaps Osama bin Laden and his gang, having pulled off 9-11 had planned all along simply to stop with that, uh, contenting themselves for the future with smaller and less spectacular attacks of the kinds we saw in Bali, Madrid, London, and a few months ago in Amman, Jordan. But I rather doubt it. Perhaps bin Laden expected to have the United States immediately invade Afghanistan and depose the Taliban and drive him so deeply into the mountains that it now takes him about 10 days to two weeks to get his tapes to Al Jazeera, but I rather doubt it. Perhaps he also expected that within two years of 9-11, the United States would have further expanded its presence in the Middle East by invading Iraq, but I rather doubt that too. Inasmuch as we know anything at all of bin Laden's own grand strategy, it was so to demoralize the United States that it would get out of the Middle East altogether that it would return to a kind of continental isolationism, that it would leave the way open for Al Qaeda to spread Taliban regimes throughout the Muslim world with a view to restoring the caliphate. Now that hasn't happened, it's not <coughs> likely to happen, and the principal reason, I think, has been the Bush grand strategy, which has been rather dramatically different from the strategies previous administrations, extending all the way back to Reagan's, had followed with regard to terrorism in that part of the world. So I guess I would give the administration a grade of, say, A minus on this objective, my one reservation being that it has failed as of yet to capture or kill bin Laden and his remaining top associates. That's the first objective of the strategy. The second objective is more complicated and the record is more mixed. The second objective was to remove or alter regimes that might support terrorist attacks in the future. The reasoning behind this was that no terrorist gang, however international its organizational structure, could operate without at least some state support, whether in terms of financing or the provision of manpower and weaponry or communications and training facilities. And of course, that's precisely what the Taliban regime in Afghanistan was doing, and the Bush administration was remarkably successful in eliminating that regime quickly, effectively, and at minimal cost. I know that this statement may elicit some objections, given the fact that Afghanistan is by no means even today a secure state, and that the Karzai regime is by no means a liberal democracy. But within the long history of Afghanistan, I think it's worth asking the question compared to what? As the experience of other invaders of Afghanistan ranging from the Soviet Union through the British all the way back to Alexander the Great makes painfully clear, few nations anywhere have more successfully resisted conquest. And for all the shortcomings of the Karzai government, it surely is closer to a liberal democracy now <laughs> than Afghanistan has ever been at any point in its long and troubled history. So I would regard Afghanistan as a success for the Bush grand strategy, uh, indeed a pretty remarkable uh, success. I think there have been other successes as well that we read less in the papers about. The most striking one, to my mind, uh, has been Libya, where Colonel Gaddafi, a serial supporter of terrorism over the years, <coughs> 
simply decided that there was nothing further to be gained from those activities and he would rejoin the civilized world. Was the Bush grand strategy responsible for this change of heart? Well, we will only know when the Qaddafi archives are opened. Uh, but it certainly didn't hurt. I think we can say that much. I would say a second but more mixed success, this situation is still playing itself out, is Syria, where the international backlash against the Hariri assassination last year in Lebanon has brought about a long overdue withdrawal of Syrian troops uh, from Lebanon. Uh, how much Lebanon is still going to remain within Syrian influence remains to be seen. But it is a different situation. And curiously, the prime movers in this situation were that unlikely couple, George W. Bush and Jacques Chirac. A third success, one you don't read very much about, I think is Algeria. <clears throat> this is a country that went through a violent civil war, pitting militant Islamists against a repressive government. And yet today, my friend Bob Kaplan, the journalist who's been there frequently, tells me Algeria is calm, safe, and providing some of the most valuable intelligence that we're getting these days on Al-Qaeda. Nor do you hear very much about Morocco or Tunisia these days, which is probably also a good sign. In Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan, undemocratic states that are nonetheless our allies in the war against terror, it's probably fair to say that the situation is not much better, but also not much worse than it was in the year 2001. These countries are a long way from truly free elections, but they're also a long way from becoming bases for Al Qaeda. Palestine, I would argue, is both a success and a failure. I think Bush was certainly right for taking the position for which he was much criticized at the time that there was no point in trying to work with Yasser Arafat in seeking to advance the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Um, Arafat, too, was a serial supporter of terrorism, despite his Nobel Peace Prize. And I know of very few people now who would question the Bush strategy of simply ignoring Arafat and waiting for him to die. Again, a very different strategy from the strategy of the preceding administration. Nor is Bush's embrace of Ariel Sharon any longer controversial, though it certainly was at the time, for Sharon did make progress where no Israeli leader before him had done in removing Jewish settlements from the occupied territories. Sharon defeated the Second Intifada. He's created a stronger basis, I think, for a two-state solution <clears throat> than has ever existed before in that region. And he's realigned Israeli politics in support of that solution in a way that seems so far to have survived his passing from the scene. Finally, free and fair elections were held last week for the first time ever in the Palestinian territories. The only problem here is that they produced a surprise uh, victory for Hamas, an outcome uh, together with the uh, that together with the recent Iranian elections has led some critics to say that the entire Bush strategy of promoting democracy in the Middle East is flawed. But my question here is, even allowing for these unfortunate outcomes, what is the alternative? Were we to tell the Palestinian people or the Iranian people that they could not have free elections in the first place, given what those people have been through over many decades as a result of not having or not being allowed uh, to have free elections? One of the problems with democracy is that its results are sometimes unpredictable. The Bush administration has taken the view fairly consistently that it prefers living with that problem of unpredictability uh, over the problems that come from supporting authoritarian regimes. Supporting authoritarian regimes is inconsistent with our own values. It is usually an unsustainable uh, policy and the results of supporting authoritarians can also be unpredictable. If you're unwilling to see uh, the Palestinians uh, locked up, or if you're unwilling to see the Israelis driven into the sea, then it looks to me like a two-state solution is about the only way to go. And if that's right, then it makes sense to have governments for each of these states that are accountable to the people who live there. And the previous Palestinian government, the one that has just been overthrown, precisely lacked accountability. Hamas is now stuck with accountability, and we'll see how that one works out. This is no formula for immediate harmony, 
but it may be the best chance uh, of some rather uh, unpleasant alternatives for both states of survivability. So what about the other problem with Iran, as well as the similar problem with North Korea, that these are states that have supported terrorism in the past and are seeking to obtain and may already have obtained weapons of mass destruction? How well is the Bush strategy of removing or altering dangerous regimes working in these situations? Has the Bush strategy actually provoked them into becoming more dangerous? Well, I think in one sense, no, both Iran and North Korea were well on the way to developing weapons of mass destruction before the Bush administration ever took office. It's worth uh, remembering that the Clinton administration came very close to taking preemptive action against North Korea uh, in 1994 over this issue. But I think it is certainly fair to suggest that the Bush administration's open talk about preemption, something that no other administration had done so openly, uh, together with its um, use of that strategy in Iraq, could well have reinforced the conviction on the part of the North Koreans and the Iranians that an actual or potential nuclear capability provides the best insurance policy that they can buy. And they're probably right about that. At the same time, I think it's important to note that for all the criticism of the Bush administration's unilateralism, the administration has been careful to proceed multilaterally in both of these situations. And whether it would have done so if its invasion of Iraq had gone as planned is something we'll never know for sure. But they have been multilateral in these two um, instances. So what seems clear for the moment, to the extent that anything is clear, uh, is that what happens with regard to North Korea and Iran will happen as a result of what the international community does. The six powers involved in the North Korean situation, the United Nations and the European Union and the IAEA in the case of Iran, what those organizations decide to do. The outcome is not likely to reflect one way or another decisions made by the Bush administration alone. North Korea and Iran then fall under the heading of shared responsibility. Whatever the failures or successes that occur there, they will almost certainly not be those of the Bush administration alone, but more largely of the international community. Now that is surely not the case, however, for Iraq, another state supporter of terrorism for which the Bush administration must accept sole responsibility for better or for worse. Iraq is therefore the single case most likely to determine how history is going to regard the Bush grand strategy. I think the first thing to say, I know that the first thing to say about Iraq is that it certainly did not go according to plan. So let's start with what the plan actually was. The administration gave at least six reasons for invading Iraq. The likelihood that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction his flouting of United Nations resolutions, his abuse of his own people, his support for Palestinian terrorists, the failure of the sanctions and the oil for food regime, and the possibility that Saddam might have had some involvement with September 11. None of these were completely insincere, but none came close to conveying, I think, the most important reason for the invasion of Iraq. And this was, I believe, as Tom Friedman commented at the time, we invaded Iraq simply because we could invade Iraq. North Korea and Iran would have been much more difficult to do. And why did we want to do that? Why did we want to invade some country? I think the answer is to frighten anybody else in the Middle East or elsewhere who might be harboring or thinking about harboring terrorists. We intended to send a signal that Afghanistan was not a one-off situation, that we had the capability to do this again, and that anybody who was thinking about harboring terrorists uh, had better watch this demonstration and be sobered uh, by the effects of it. It was a little like the parking signs that Mayor Koch used to put up in the city of New York. Don't even think about parking here. Uh, now, and what did we expect? that the outcome would be when we went in. I think we expected that Iraq would be as easy as our unexpected success in Afghanistan. And I think what happened in Afghanistan powerfully motivated the decision uh, to go into Iraq. The term cakewalk was used occasionally about Iraq. Uh, 
The argument was that if we could, that we could use a minimal amount of force to topple Saddam Hussein, that we would be greeted as liberators and that the psychological effects of this victory and the new constitutional democracy that would presumably follow would then extend throughout the Middle East. That, I think, was the expectation. Now, obviously, it didn't work out that way for several reasons. First of all, the administration failed to get the multilateral support it had uh, expected, both to legitimize uh, the invasion and to provide at least some of the manpower necessary to carry it out. There's little point now in trying to go back and assign, assign the blame for these failures that can be left to the historians. Uh, there's plenty of blame to go around on all sides. Plenty of it does lie in Washington. Second, the administration failed to recognize that it would need more troops to occupy the country than it had needed to invade the country. This was a failure of planning of the first order. It's a classic example of what we used to describe at the Naval War College as the dog and car syndrome. That is, dogs spend a lot of time thinking about chasing cars and actually chasing cars, but they rarely think very much about what they would actually do with a car if they ever caught one. <laughs> Third, the occupation policies the administration improvised, and there is no other word for it, failed to reflect the complexities of Iraqi domestic politics. Wheels had to be reinvented several different times. Fourth, inexcusable laxity in administering the occupation allowed the actions of a few at Abu Ghraib to compound concerns that already existed about the treatment of prisoners at Guantanamo, with results that came close to compromising fatally the most convincing moral justification for the invasion, which was Saddam Hussein's own record of abusing human rights. And finally, the administration failed to prepare the American people for the sacrifices that Iraq would involve, for the president to have declared mission accomplished at a time when well over 90 percent of the casualties were yet to be suffered was smug self-congratulation. It was not grand strategy. And so, is history likely to regard Iraq as Bush's Vietnam? as so many of the administration's critics and as so many of my Yale faculty colleagues uh, are absolutely convinced will be the case. I don't think so for the following reasons. First of all, the insurgents in Vietnam had the support of a state, North Vietnam, which in turn had the military and economic support of two superpowers, the Soviet Union and China. There is nothing like that level of external support today for the Iraqi insurgents. Secondly, the human costs of the Iraq war have yet to approach anything like uh, Vietnam. Uh, all casualties are terrible, but it still is the case that after some three years of fighting in Vietnam, the weekly toll of American combat deaths was running into the hundreds. And of course, Vietnamese casualties were much higher than that. Uh, it was always an illusion to think that we could fight this war as we fought the war in Kosovo and suffer very few casualties. But at the same time, we have suffered many fewer casualties uh, than was the case with the war in Vietnam. And so the domestic effects of all of this are quite different. The country has not been torn, torn apart to anything like the extent that it was by the war in Vietnam. Third, the economic costs of the war in Iraq are also comparatively much smaller. At the height of the Vietnam War in 1968, 46% of the national budget went to military expenditures and 42% to human and physical resources. This year, the comparable figures will be 19% for military expenditures and 70% for human and physical resources. In 1968, we spent 9.5% of gross domestic product on defense. This year, the figure will be about 4%. Now, where there is a problem, and it certainly is a huge problem, is that our all-volunteer military is greatly overstretched. But that overstretch of the all-volunteer military in turn reflects a willingness to learn from the mistakes of Vietnam, the mistakes that included using a draft to fight the war, the mistakes that included uh, inserting a massive military presence into that country. They reflect learning from the Vietnam experience rather than the likelihood of replicating the Vietnam experience, it seems to me. Fourth, there is no single anti-American nationalist cause in Iraq as there was in Vietnam. Instead, 
each of the three major factions in Iraq, the Shia, the Sunnis, the Kurds, have reasons to want us to stay because they fear one another uh, quite often more than they do us. And I suspect if we were to announce we were leaving tomorrow, we would have requests from all three factions. Please don't leave under the current situation. That's very different from Vietnam. Now, just how that three-way struggle is going to play out in the constitutional uh, arrangements that are made, what kind of influence uh, the neighboring state of Iran is going to have, remains to be seen. Uh, but nonetheless, again, it's a different situation from Vietnam. Fifth, the means of measuring success in Iraq are, I think, elusive. All of the indicators looked bleak, indeed, last fall and winter, and then suddenly the January 30 elections made the situation look entirely different, as even the, as even the New York Times was forced to acknowledge the, uh, the next morning. I almost fell off my chair over breakfast uh, at this. Most of the indicators looked bleak again this summer and fall, and then suddenly the October 15th elections made the situation look quite different. And of course, much the same thing happened in the run-up to the December 15th elections. But the result of these three elections is that uh, after some three years of American intervention, Iraq is arguably the most democratic of all the Arab states. Now, does that guarantee uh, predictably pro-American governments? Nobody could claim that. Is it an improvement over the kind of government the Iraqis had before? It would be difficult to deny, to deny that. Is the rest of the Middle East watching very carefully what happens in Iraq? At least on that point, there's no debate at all. And finally, those who would regard Iraq as a failure and who would advocate immediate or even phased withdrawal should be asked to consider what a withdrawal of that kind might mean for the Iraqi people. For the Vietnamese, remember, the American withdrawal meant prison or re-education camps that drove tens of thousands of Vietnamese to try to flee by boat. And for the Cambodians, it meant a regime, Pol Pot's regime, that wound up killing one out of every five Cambodians. In this respect, there is, I think, a similarity to Vietnam. It has to do with what we would wish to have on our consciences if we too precipitately withdraw. So, Iraq, then, is certainly not a success, and there is much to be learned from why that is so. But I don't think it's a total failure either. History and life do allow for the possibility that situations can lie somewhere in between those two extremes, and I think that's where Iraq is. So for the second objective of the Bush grand strategy, that of removing or altering regimes that support or might support terrorism, I guess the grade I would give would have to be uh, at most a C plus. There is a lot of room for uh, improvement, but it's not a total failure at this point. The third objective of the Bush grand strategy, and certainly its most ambitious objective, has been to restructure the international system in such a way as to eliminate the conditions that breed terrorism in the first place. And paradoxically, I would argue the administration has done better in advancing this long-term objective than it has the more intermediate objective of regime change. It's important to be clear, though, first of all, how the President and his advisors think about this issue, because there's been a good deal of confusion uh, on this point. First of all, Bush and his team assume that tyranny, not poverty, not religious fanaticism, not even resentment toward the United States, is what breeds terrorism. For when governments deny people opportunities for political expression and economic development, those people fall into a kind of despair that makes them susceptible to the appeals of religious fanaticism and the terrorism that that fanaticism tends to breed. Now, in this, the administration's thinking is not greatly different from that of the architects of the Marshall Plan back in 1947, who saw the enemy, uh, also saw the enemy as despair in this case, the despair that could make Europeans susceptible to the appeal of communism, and who saw Europeans who might see the solution uh, as, uh, uh, or the planners saw that solution as one of rebuilding Europe for the purpose of eliminating uh, that despair. So there are some parallels here. Now this requires containing and then rolling back authoritarianism, just as our Cold War strategy required containing and ultimately rolling back the Soviet Union and international communism. 
Uh, secondly, as this analogy to the Cold War suggests, the Bush administration sees the containment rolling back and ultimate elimination of tyranny as a long-term objective not to be accomplished within this administration or even within this decade. It is, as the President said in the second inaugural, the work of a generation. Third, the Middle East is the focus of this strategy, though not the sole target of it, because the Middle East is the one part of the world where tyranny is still the most deeply rooted, where the remarkable progress that was made toward democratization and toward the advancement of human rights during the last half of the 20th century has been least evident. Now, this failure to democratize, this failure to eliminate tyrants, was not the administration insists, because anything in Islamic culture precludes uh, democracy. Indeed, there are already and have been for years Islamic democracies in places like Turkey, Indonesia, and lest we forget India, which also qualifies as an Islamic democracy. Uh, this failure to democratize in the Middle East results rather from the geological accident of where oil lies under the surface of the earth because of the resulting economic windfalls have insulated the regimes of that part of the world from the pressures to institute democratic governance and market economics that have pushed most of the rest of the world toward those objectives. So it is, I think, in this sense, all about oil. But it's not all about oil in the way that Michael Moore and other critics of the administration uh, have suggested. Because had the administration's only motive been access to oil, it would have done what certain officials of the United Nations bureaucracy, we now know, and certain members of the Security Council, we now know, did in fact do, which was to cut a deal with Saddam Hussein to leave him in power and have him sell us all the oil that we needed. What the administration is really trying to do is to break the link between oil and tyranny in the Middle East, which is what it believes has fueled and financed terrorism in that part of the world. There, that's one other thing, it seems to me, that Iraq is all about. Not just removing Saddam Hussein and scaring other states that might support terrorists, but also showing that a major oil-rich Islamic state in the middle of the Middle East can develop, if not a democratic government by American or Canadian or Scandinavian standards, then at least a constitutional government that allows its people to choose their own leaders and protects their rights. And the assumption is that if this can be made to work in Iraq, and I think the jury is still out on that proposition, then the effects will spread elsewhere in the Middle East without the need for military intervention. The thinking is that Iraq can become for that part of the world what Germany and Japan were for Europe and East Asia after World War II. Iraq is meant to be a domino that causes other dominoes to topple, but in our favor. Now, obviously, there are a lot of questions to be raised about these grandiose objectives. First of all, how can we expect Iraq to serve as a model for the Middle East when we've screwed it up so badly? This is a very good question. And that's why it's important, so important, to make sure that what we're doing in Iraq actually succeeds. Because if we fail there, as we did in Vietnam, the dominoes that topple definitely will not be toppling in our favor. Then if tyranny is our target, people have argued in the Middle East, how can we continue to have tyrannical or at least authoritarian allies like the Saudis or the Egyptians uh, or the Pakistanis? The answer to this one, I think, is pretty easy. It's for the same reason that Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill chose to fight alongside Stalin's Soviet Union in defeating Hitler's Germany. You can't take on all tyrants at once. You need help from some, even as you go after others. But you can set the objective, as this administration has done, of having no tyrants left anywhere in the world by some indefinite point in the 21st century, some two or three decades out. Um, for all of its failings, no, uh, of the failings of the current administration, no previous American administration has set that as the objective of the United States, the end of tyranny in our time. Is there any evidence that such an ambitious strategy can actually work? And I think the answer is yes, there's quite a lot of evidence that it can work. First of all, look at history, the long-term trends uh, 
extending back as far as the American Revolution itself have shown a progressive spread of democracy and a diminishing number of tyrannies. Uh, trends that are this deeply rooted that extend over some 200 years are not apt to reverse themselves overnight. Secondly, look at the present. What alternative vision uh, do the opponents of the Bush brand strategy in the Middle East actually have to offer? From what I can see, what they have to offer is some kind of gigantic Taliban empire. And if you were a betting person and you had to bet on which vision of the future is likely to be most attractive to the people of the Middle East, what would you choose? Democracy or a gigantic Taliban caliphate? I think I'd vote for democracy as most likely. Finally, look at the future. The test of a good grand strategy is to specify destinations. Where do you want to be two or three or four decades from now? The Truman administration did this successfully in the early days of the Cold War. It set a destination, a world safe from the Soviet Union and international communism, and the nation stuck to it through all kinds of setbacks until the strategy finally prevailed. And what better destination is there out there right now for us than a world in which democracy has become universal and in which tyranny has become extinct? As long as we're going to have a destination, Let's have a good one. All of which finally, in conclusion, brings me around to one last issue, and that is this. Why isn't the Democratic Party behind this strategy? This strategy is in the best tradition, after all, of Woodrow Wilson, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry S. Truman, John F. Kennedy, Jimmy Carter, and even if you consider his military interventions against tyranny in the Balkans, Bill Clinton. Yet I fear that far too many Democrats, certainly the ones I know around Yale, respond in this way, that if George W. Bush is in favor of making the world safe for democracy, then we, the Democrats, have got to be against it. We can no longer be interested in promoting freedom. I had one friend tell me uh, earlier last year, uh, sometime last year, that it was perfectly all right for Clinton to come to the rescue of the Bosnian Muslims and the Kosovars. But if the Iraqis had to be rescued by Bush, they would have been better off remaining under Saddam Hussein's rule. Now, this position, I think, manages to be both silly and morally offensive at the same time. It's not worthy of the great political party in which I was brought up and of which I would like to still consider myself a member. It makes personality the basis of politics in much the same way that FDR's Republican critics used to do back in the 1930s and the 1940s. Some of the older people in the room may remember one of the most famous of all New Yorker cartoons from the late 1930s. It's two New York couples in their furs, tuxedos, and spats, one of whom has turned to the other and said, come along, we're going down to the trans lux to hiss Roosevelt. That's the attitude, it seems to me, of far too many Democrats these days. What happened in the 1940s, though, was the evolution of a bipartisan consensus on the things that really counted, winning the war, preserving the reforms of the New Deal, rejecting post-war isolationism, and embracing the strategy of containment. These became bipartisan objectives shared by both parties. And the fact that this happened wound up saving the Republican Party, which in, uh, could very well have gone down the path of isolationism uh, abroad, which could have led to its political extinction, it seems to me, at home. Now, I think something like this now needs to happen within the Democratic Party. There needs to be recognition that whatever you may think of George W. Bush and however you may feel about Iraq, his administration in the aftermath of 9-11 has launched this country on a long-term uh, grand strategy that is consistent with this country's long-term historic values and its long-term future interests. And so I think the task for the Democrats in the year 2008, the next presidential year and afterwards, will not be to reject that strategy, but to find ways, and believe me, there are plenty of them, to make it work better. I think it's high time the Democrats set their minds to this. Thank you very much for your attention.
Well, we thank you for a, a, a most thoughtful and very interesting presentation. Uh, Dr. Gaddis will now field questions. Uh, the question was, isn't uh, Jordan more of a democracy than we can ever hope that Iraq uh, will be? The second question was, um, um, sorry, give me the second one again. The federal deficit. Ah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Really right. Under this administration. Depen uh -huh. Dependence on the Chinese. Yes. Totalitarians buying right, right, right. Paper does yeah. This not limit mm -hmm. our ability to spread democracy. Yeah. Okay, well, first on uh, Jordan, uh, I'm really not a Middle Eastern. Uh, pardon? Uh, um, well, let me start the first question. This is getting confusing. Uh, first on Jordan, I'm not really a Middle Eastern expert, so uh, um, I can't really speak with great knowledge uh, on this. But I do have the um, sense that Jordan has not had the same degree of free elections that have taken place in Iraq in the last three years or so. Correct me if I'm wrong about this, Jordanian experts in the room. Uh, Jordan certainly is a loyal ally and has been cooperative in its relationship with Israel. And it certainly would be the last on the list of countries that we would try to change the regime of, it seems to me. But I don't think it's quite far as far along as even Iraq is in terms of constitutional processes and elections uh, at this point. Now, your second point, which is a much more serious point, it seems to me, and that is the fiscal situation not related to the conduct of the war in Iraq, but simply related to the overall state of the economy and the extent to which we are dependent on uh, the Chinese and other foreign investors to finance our deficit. Yes, I think this is quite an alarming uh, problem. And I think it's quite separate uh, from uh, some of the things that I was talking about that directly pertain to the Bush strategy in the Middle East. It has to do with another problem of the Bush administration which is that it's actually ferociously liberal. And by that, I mean it likes to spend a lot of money. Um, and at the same time, it is ferociously conservative in the sense that it does not like to raise taxes. Now, this is a problem. This cannot really be sustained, it seems to me, over a long period of time. And I think there is going to be uh, a reckoning on this score. And this could very well affect our ability to conduct uh, foreign policy, and, and it could certainly affect our ability to conduct domestic policy, as far as that goes, uh, in the long-term sense. So yes, I would hope that this would be uh, an element of grand strategy that would be taken into account, and I think it's foolish not to do that. All right, the question was, um, to what extent um, were there any inklings in the 2000 campaign that Bush was going to embrace a grand strategy of this um, scale? Uh, to what extent was there foreknowledge of the 9-11 attack? To what extent was 9-11 used as the suggestion was made Pearl Harbor could also have been used to justify a massive expenditure, a massive expansion of American responsibilities um, in, the, in the world? You're right about the first of those points. Bush said nothing about this in the 2000 campaign. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, in the 1932 campaign, ran on a platform of balancing the budget and promoting isolationism. Uh, you can't always tell from what people say when they are running for office what they will do when they come into office because circumstances intervene. So the banking crash and the depression intervened and forced action on Roosevelt's part. Pardon me? I said he certainly didn't do that on purpose. Who? Roosevelt. I agree. Uh, so circumstances intervene. Uh, and uh, it's also the case that uh, Pearl Harbor intervened. Now, there has been for years a conspiracy theory uh, suggesting that Roosevelt had advanced warning of Pearl Harbor, knew that this was coming, did nothing to avoid it, even arranged to have our ships sunk in shallow water um, <laughs> uh, so that he could get into the war in Europe. I don't buy it, and I know of no serious historian who buys it. And the reason for this is quite simply that there could be no assurance that if the Japanese attacked, Hitler would then, as he did four days later, declare war. The whole theory about the back door to war uh, gives no guarantee that Pearl Harbor would have got us into the war in Europe that Roosevelt admittedly wished to get into, uh, because that took the idiocy of Hitler in declaring war on us, a totally unpredictable uh, event. So the Pearl Harbor thesis um, does not hold up. As far as 9-11 is concerned, I don't think the conspiracy thesis holds up there uh, either. It's very easy to go back and look at the intelligence and say, here are the smoking guns and we should have seen this. Uh, 
but precisely the best book on the interpretation of intelligence is Roberta Wolstetter's book on Pearl Harbor, who shows that uh, intelligence is a matter, uh, intelligence is a great haystack, and you're looking for a needle in it, separating out the signals from the noise is almost impossible to do in uh, situations, particularly when uh, something is a surprise, when your own preconceptions have not led you to expect that this could possibly happen, and that was true of Pearl Harbor, as it was true of uh, September 11. As far as the neocon conspiracy is concerned, I think that too is too simplistic uh, an explanation. I just was um, rudely awakened about this um, just uh, last week when Fred Barnes' new book on Bush came out. And Fred Barnes' new book on Bush actually says that um, President Bush read John Gaddis's book, Surprise Security and the American Experience, in 2000 and, uh, 2002, and then promptly invaded Iraq. <laughs> now, <laughs> there is a problem with this, because the book didn't come out until 2004. Uh, <laughs> so the causal relationship is not immediately clear. So I emailed my uh, great colleague at Yale, Don Kagan, who is normally thought of as being part of the neocon uh, conspiracy, and said, look at this, Don. And he emailed back and said, this is such a relief, John. Uh, I and my two sons, uh, Bob and Fred, had been regarded as the source of all evil, and now it's clear <laughs> that you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm sorry, I just don't buy it. I think it's too simple. Life is too complicated. The question was, 15 of the Saudis, uh, 15 of the hijackers were Saudis. What was done to wrap the knuckles of the Saudis? I do not know what was done to wrap the knuckles of the Saudis. I suspect a lot of that is still classified uh, information. I don't doubt that some very tough signals were sent and some very tough language was used. And how do I know that? Because the Saudis, if you pick up any copy these days of the New Republic or other American magazines, the Saudis are taking out full-page, multi-page ads to try to make their case. They wouldn't be doing this if they hadn't been wrapped over the knuckles about this. They are powerfully scrambling, peddling, uh, to try to retrieve their reputation uh, in this regard. More significantly, though, uh, it's become clear in the period since September 11th that al-Qaeda al poses a threat to the Saudi regime itself. They've got their own internal threat to worry about, and that's a lot more important than us wrapping them over the knuckles. So they have been cracking down on their own dissidents. They have every reason to because the survival of their regime is at stake. And this gets to the larger issue here posed by al-Qaeda. The challenge is not just to the United States. The challenge is to the state system itself, to the international system of states. Uh, and in this sense, we're all in this uh, together. We're all being challenged uh, in this way. And I think increasingly uh, the mature states, the uh, reasonable states in much of the rest of the world, Asia, the Middle East, uh, Europe, are recognizing this. They don't always advertise it. They don't always trumpet it. But it seems to me that this sense uh, is beginning to sink in, and every succeeding terrorist attack that takes place, whether it's in Jordan or whether it's in Britain or whether it's in Spain, sooner or later reinforces that assumption. I think this is even happening in the Middle East, where it seems to me interesting lines of fracture are developing within the Islamic movement about the uh, legitimacy of terror tactics, suicide bombings, hostages, beheadings, all of this kind of thing. There's a fascinating debate that's going on there, too. So uh, that's a long way from your initial question, what did we do to wrap the knuckles of the Saudis, but um, I think that is happening. Question was, if Hamas next week should announce that it recognizes the existence of the State of Israel, what would be the response of the Israelis? Would they withdraw the remaining settlements from the West Bank? Uh, what would be the response of the United States uh, to this development? Uh, first of all, I don't think it's going to happen next week, but I think it could happen over a longer period of time. Um, when it does happen, if it does happen, the response would not be instantaneous. It seems to me that the Israelis and the Americans would wish to uh, see words matched with deeds. So I don't think there would be any instant uh, response here. But I was impressed by the Israeli reaction to the Hamas victory. The Israeli reaction was not one of panic or hysteria. In fact, a fair number of Israelis seem to have welcomed this victory for a couple of reasons, because it clarified the issues, uh, 
and also because it uh, threw out Fatah, uh, who had been a totally ineffective negotiating partner. You know, you were dealing with Fatah, but Fatah was had no authority. Um, now the people are in charge who, for better or worse, have authority. Uh, the people who have been uh, uh, launching the terrorist attacks now have the obligation of running a government. They're going to discover that they can't continue to do what they have done in the past. They will either they will have to make a choice. They will have to either continue to be a terrorist organization, in which case they will be out of government because they will not be able to sustain the necessary services uh, which uh, helped to get them elected in the first place, uh, or they will become an accepted, accountable state, in which case they will have to give up terrorism. So I think the dilemma these days rests with Hamas uh, more than it does with the Israelis or with the Americans. The question is, uh, you don't hear much about Latin America in the Bush grand strategy, and that's absolutely uh, correct. Um, and I can even tell you a, a story about this. Uh, several of us, meaning professors, um, 10 or 12 of us, were um, invited down to the State Department uh, back in the spring uh, to meet with Condi Rice. Um, and we were given the floor to say what was on our minds in the most uh, candid way, uh, which we did, we thought, with great clarity and comprehensiveness and so on. <laughs> and after two hours of our pontifications, Condi politely said, nobody has said a word about Latin America and Africa. And then she proceeded to do so with great sagacity. Uh, and wisdom and uh, embarrassingly exposing our own omissions in this regard. So I think there is awareness at the top level in the State Department of uh, this problem. At the same time, how much of this awareness percolates through to the White House and how much of this uh, awareness actually percolates through to policy issues is uh, a different matter. On humanitarian issues in Africa, the administration has led, I think, in some significant ways. I think Latin America is probably the area where they have been least effective, least engaged, and at the same time where uh, interesting and sometimes disturbing developments are, are taking place because there is a swing back toward the left in Latin America. This could involve a swing back toward more authoritarian regimes. Chavez is uh, pretty popular in Latin America. Sooner or later, we're going to have to confront uh, the implications of this, and part of it does stem from our neglect. So I think it's a mixed answer. I think in the State Department, yes, that awareness is there. I'm not sure it is in the White House. Uh, if the Council strategy or goal of the Council strategy is to illuminate uh, contemporary American policy, I think Professor Gaddis has helped us enormously in doing that. It's been a wonderfully enjoyable and informative evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.